Welcome to another episode of What Did the Patients Say with Drs. Dana and Lauren Brindisi, sisters and owners of Carolina Functional Neurology Center. We are providing you answers to frequently asked questions and bringing you inside information from real conversations we have with patients on a daily basis. Our goal is to spread the truth on health and healing because we believe everyone deserves to know the answers. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of What Did the Patient Say with myself, Dr. Lauren Brindisi with Carolina Functional Neurology Center. And today we're going to be talking about functional neurological disorder. Now, functional neurological disorder, you would hope, the name of our clinic is Carolina Functional Neurology Center, that we would have some knowledge and understanding of functional neurological disorder and how to treat it. And I will say that if you guys could see my screen right now, I have a ton of information and notes written down because I have a lot for us to talk about. And where I really wanna start is just better understanding some of the history and the more traditional viewpoints on functional neurological disorder, which I'm sure if you're listening to this, either you or a loved one have been diagnosed with functional neurological disorder. And I want you to know that my mission in this podcast is for you to leave here with a better understanding of truly what functional neurological disorder is, what the proposed theories are around it, and how we can go about treating it without therapy. I'm not saying that therapy isn't needed and I'm a huge fan of therapy. I think that everybody needs a therapist and there are some cases of functional neurological disorder that do need psychiatry and medical interventions in that way. But from my clinical experience, the majority of patients that I see with FND, we can come up with a better answer and provide some true objective information about what is going on in the patient's nervous system. But let's start by just better understanding the traditional medical viewpoint of functional neurological disorder. So when we look at the literature, really functional neurological disorder has some AKAs, conversion disorder, psychogenic disorder. A lot of patients who struggle with these issues related to FND get fluffed off as this being a psychological problem and they get sent to therapy, psychiatry, cognitive behavioral therapy, when patients are struggling with extremely real symptomatology. But per the literature, when we're looking at a traditional medical viewpoint of FND, really the outline is just saying that FND is a neurological condition in which patients are not presenting with any known structural or neurochemical issue that they can find. And you know what? There's a lot of other conditions that would likely fit under that diagnosis as well. Migraine, also a neurological condition that doesn't show any structural abnormalities. Concussions, which are mild traumatic brain injuries, also don't show any other, any structural abnormalities. When we look at an MRI, like we might see with a traumatic brain injury, we see many patients with forms of dysautonomia that show no structural or neurochemical changes in their brain and their MRIs come back clear. Why and how is FND any different? With FND, Patient symptomatology, this is really a syndrome. It comes with a whole multitude of symptoms and every case is a little bit different. Patients can deal with seizure-like activity, which is often called psychogenic seizures, which I personally like the term non-epileptic seizure activity better. They deal with movement disorder issues that don't always fit into a specific movement disorder box. They can have cognitive problems, dizziness, speech issues, paralysis, too much movement, not enough movement, issues on one side versus the other, problems with sensory, so vision, hearing loss, pain, which can include chronic migraines, um, and then even numbness and tingling in different parts of their body. That's a lot of stuff. And so I will say we see a decent amount of FND in our practice, and no two patients are the same. 
I think that this diagnosis really boils down to we cannot fit you into some other neurological box and there is no known structural finding that could justify the symptomatology that you're having. And so you get clumped into this diagnosis of FND, which I don't think is a terrible diagnosis. That does make sense for what is happening. Where I feel like the medical community, our traditional medical community is falling short is that there's more for us to investigate than just chalking this up to a psychological disorder. We hear this all the time. It's just anxiety. Well, there's so much more for us to investigate if something is just anxiety. And a lot of times that means that there are functional issues that need to be looked at from a different perspective. And this is really where we as functional neurologists come in because we can better assess the function of somebody's brain and start to make sense of this. For example, I have two patients right now who have the same diagnosis of FND, and they do not present in the same way whatsoever. One of the patients is a chronic migrainer, and she now started to struggle with issues related to movement, but only on one side of her body. And these will be episodic. They can coincide with her migraines, and she will struggle with dystonia-like symptoms, choreiform-like movements, rigidity, trouble moving pretty much and coordinating the information on the right side of her body. I have another patient who also was diagnosed with FND who will struggle with episodes of paralysis. All of a sudden, she cannot move or coordinate both of her legs She begins to have trouble with her speech and she gets like aphasia. So she'll start and she will want to say certain things and you can tell that she's trying to get the information out, but it's not coming out right. This is what's called a Wernicke's aphasia. And we see this in patients who have strokes in specific parts of their brain. They can struggle with something like a Wernicke's aphasia. We also, then that kind of progresses and she starts to develop more of what's called a Broca's aphasia, which we can also see in patients who have had strokes in specific areas. And again, those are hard structural lesions. We can take an MRI and we can say, here is the area that the patient had the stroke in and it makes sense that they're having X, Y, and Z symptoms. With FND, it's a functional problem. And I'm not, I'm not a researcher. I am not the one who is leading the way in better understanding FND um, from a research perspective, but I've got boots on the ground every day seeing these patients. And I will say a lot of patients with FND mimic patients with migraine. And migraine is also not just a headache. It's a neurological condition that we are now better understanding is impacting the function of the brain. It's causing changes and rapid depolarization in specific parts of the brain. And now we have migraine types that don't even present with headaches. And so I think down the road, as we continue to have more information about FND, which we will, because unfortunately there are more and more people being diagnosed with FND, is that we're gonna start to see that there are probably some of these similar functional depolarization mechanisms or something different that is a transient impact on the function of somebody's brain, but that could be happening in different parts of the brain. And so for this patient, when she starts to develop this Broca's aphasia, all of a sudden she can't speak. So now she can't speak, she can't move her legs, and she's very aware of what is going on. She's basically stuck. And then it takes some time and she uses some different coping strategies to try to pull herself out of these episodes, but it's just not enough. So, functional neurology. How does this come into play in patients with FND? Well, 
when patients with FND come into our office, we are going to do the same thing we've done with every patient. We are going to closely assess the function of the nervous system, and we are going to start to better make sense of what is going on in their brain. For example, the patient I have who's got trouble with movement on this right side of her body, I already know that the problem, because of the, the types of movement issues that she's presenting with, she is struggling with dysfunction in her left basal ganglia. That left basal ganglia is responsible for gating the output of the frontal lobe, which is responsible for controlling voluntary motor movement. So in these transient episodes, she goes from being able to move her arms and her limbs around however she wants to and can choose to do that and she does it coordinated and she does it well. She begins to fall into one of these episodes and now she doesn't have the same type of control of the motor movement. The basal ganglia is really a gas and a brake system. Move when you're supposed to move, don't move when you're not supposed to move and only move the things you're supposed to move. So that, for instance, if I were to go and just grab something, right? All I do is I go and grab it. I pick it up just the way that I was supposed to. If somebody has issues with this motor control system, they're gonna go to move a body part and we're gonna get activation of agonist and antagonistic muscles. And so it's going to look like they're writhing or that it's rigid and they can't quite get the movement properly. And this is what's happening for her. And so when we did our exam, she wasn't having one of these episodes, but we were able to see some soft neurological signs that pointed to dysfunction in this area, even without her having an episode. Now, luckily, she took some videos, which I encourage you to do. If you have FND and you're having episodic movement disorder issues, you need to video them. Any doctor that's knowledgeable about FND is going to ask you to watch that video so that they can see and better observe exactly what's happening for you, which will be different from one person to the next. This other patient, she's having trouble, like I said, with speech, with mobility, she can't move her legs. She's telling her brain, right? She's saying, I wanna move my legs and they will not move. She's also struggling with kinds of aphasia. It seems to start like a sensory type aphasia where she's trying to say words, but it's like the wrong word is coming out or they sound like babbling. And then all of a sudden she just can't speak. Again, we understand what a Wernicke's aphasia is, and we understand what Broca's aphasia is. And from my understanding in clinical neuroscience, I immediately thought about the left side of her brain, which, caveat, she also said when it comes to mobility, if she does um, have trouble moving her legs, it tends to be worse on the right side of her body, which is controlled by your left frontal lobe. And so, also, for most people, language is lateralized to the left side of our brain. When we're thinking about something like a Wernicke's aphasia, we're actually thinking about the parietal lobe and predominantly on the left side is where Wernicke's area is, which allows you to basically properly say the words. You have Broca's area, which is in your left frontal lobe, which allows you to actually say the words. And so what I believe is happening for this patient is she's having a functional and transient episode that is causing some kind of functional change in the firing of her nervous system when it comes to taking the sensory information from the parietal lobe, processing that, feeding forward to the frontal lobe to be able to respond with a motor movement. For example, you are, this is just a normal example of, of how these pathways might get used. You are outside and a 
animal is running at you, right? You see the animal, you perceive the threat, right? You're using your visual system. You see the animal, maybe you smell it, you hear it, and you can tell that it's coming closer to you. Your brain is taking all that information and processing it almost instantaneously. And it needs that information needs to come in through your sensory systems, be integrated and processed in your parietal lobes. And then that information gets fed to your frontal lobe so that you can say, oh man, I gotta go. And you are going to make the decision to run away. And we do this all day long. We take in sensory information and we respond to it, right? Something brushes up against you and you're like, oh, what's that, right? You're just gonna maybe pull your arm away or something. Now we even have reflexive mechanisms in our spinal cord that we can talk about it another day. For instance, if you like put your hand on a hot stove, like we have mechanisms in our spine so it, it can move even faster. We didn't, our brain didn't even have to kick in so we don't burn ourselves. But when it comes to most information, we're gonna see it, process it, and then respond to it. She is struggling with her ability to do that and it becomes transient. And so from a simple functional neurological perspective, that's what we do. We want to better, we understand the main components of how the brain integrates information and the pathways that are used to do so. That is what we as functional neurologists spend a ton of time educating ourselves on. And the other part of that is, well, how can we actually exercise that area? The other part, especially, and I can't speak to all functional neurologists, but at Carolina Functional Neurology Center, we are also going to spend time investigating other stressors that could be contributing to somebody presenting in this way. For instance, I've seen people who developed FND, who had extensive histories of head injuries, surgeries on, on those side of their body where they're now beginning to have a problem, um, people who do have psychological disorders. We've seen people who struggle after they've had some type of infection. Both of these women that presented in my office both said that these symptoms came on after an infection. I will say clinically, I see a lot of people with FND who test pi positive for Lyme disease. That's not everybody. But we're gonna start to better investigate. Again, can we not only make sense of what's going on functionally in your nervous system, but are there other factors that we could look at in your history that might be driving this to happen? Can we make some sense of this other than just chalking it up to, mm, you know, must be anxiety, go ahead and, you know, just go to your therapist and talk about it and it'll just magically go away. We are just as frustrated as you guys that too many people are being told that. So if this information resonates with you at all, if you hear what I'm saying, you gotta call us. Just call, schedule a consultation, and talk to one of our doctors. See if we think this is a right fit for you and if coming in for an exam and for some treatment makes sense. We are here to support you. If you guys need anything, if you have other questions, please comment, DM us, reach out for a consultation with one of our doctors. But also, if this resonates with you because you know somebody who's struggling with this, like this, share it, comment. We are here and it's you guys who are driving us creating these videos and the questions that we're answering. This is also when you like and you share and you comment, it helps get this information out there to more people. So help us get functional neurology on the map and help us make functional neurology more mainstream. Thank you guys, I appreciate you listening. And again, my name is Dr. Lauren Brindisi and I'm here with Carolina Functional Neurology Center. We look forward to talking to you again soon.